Okay, so hello everybody who's watching on the internet and hello again to all of you out there in the audience. Um, I'm finishing up, like I said, the ocean chemistry lecture, okay? And we're actually picking up where we left off before the test, which was on number 17, Francis says. Okay, so um, it says, does cold water, so oh, by the way, we're, so we're on lecture 15, lecture assignment 15, question number 17, okay? Oh, and actually kind of question number 16, really, right? Because, uh, yeah, question number 16. So, oh, that makes it, that makes up. So, so, lecture assignment number 15, question number 16. We're just about to get into dissolved gases. So, actually, i got to get through all this stuff. Go really fast through all this. i got to turn lights off. I turned lights on. Okay, let me try this again. No, that's too much. That's not good. This one. That's what we want. Okay. Okay, so um, I do need to finish this stuff with ocean chemistry because this stuff is so important and it comes up a lot as we go through the class. So you need to you need to actually get the last bit of this on dissolved gases because you gotta know how gases and what kinds of gases dissolve into the ocean water. All right, and we got through all this stuff with equilibrium and conservative constituents and non-conservative constituents and blah, 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 so you got all that. People did really well on those questions for the most part. It probably has something to do with the fact that I explained it like two minutes before you actually got your test in your hand, so that was maybe a good, good strategy to employ. Just, um, but anyway, uh, so dissolved gases in the ocean. Oh, by the way, Kind of stupidly, I didn't. I kind of gave you some questions that maybe you need, felt like you needed the calculator. Some people did it with long division, but you might have noticed, just in case you're worried about that, you might have noticed that if you just set up the equation correctly, I gave you credit for full credit for it. So you didn't actually have to end up calculating it correctly. So if you just set it up right, and the same thing by the way with the like, um, remember that whole thing on um, echo sounding and figuring out how deep the water is on the test? I gave you full credit for that if you just set it up correctly. So if you made a little arithmetic error, I did. I just ignored it because yeah. I was like, "Oh, I should have said something about calculators." And I, I didn't. Usually, I, I usually I, I say something like, "You, you know, you can bring because you actually you can bring a scientific calculator, like you know, not your phone, but a calculator. Calculator is fine on the test. By the way, so for the final exam, you can have like a calculator for that. I try I try to avoid questions that actually require one, but um, anyway. That's all I'll say. So dissolved gases in the ocean. Uh, you know, there's a lot of dissolved gases in the ocean water. So I know that's kind of a weird thing. You're used to thinking about like salt dissolved in water, you know, but you maybe never thought that, oh, actually gas dissolves in water as well. And you actually you have a lot of experience with this every time you open up a fizzy drink, right? So if you open up what the Midwesterners call pop, you know, it's, it's filled with gases. Now, of course, if you look at your soda and, and you get it right, right out of the vending machine, you look at it, you can't see the bubbles, right? You can't see the bubbles until you open it. So, so when you open it, those, those gases start to exsolve. Exsolve is the opposite of dissolve. So they start to exsolve out, okay? So, uh, you know, fish, of course, take advantage of this. Fish breathe underwater. They use oxygen just like you do, right? And by the way, a lot of people think that fish somehow like break the H2O molecules apart and take the oxygen off of the hydrogens. That's not how that works, right? So they're literally breathing the gases that are dissolved in the water, the oxygen that's dissolved in the water. So if you had to guess, without me even showing you anything, what would you guess are some of the most important, three most important gases dissolved in the ocean water? One of them you kind of get right here, right? So oxygen, right? So there's oxygen dissolved in the water. Does anybody want to guess at another one that we've actually talked about a lot, a gas that dissolves in the water? Carbon. carbon dioxide, right? And that's what makes the carbonic acid and changes the pH and alters the pH. Okay, so oxygen, carbon dioxide, and there's another one that you might be able to guess. That is, what's that? Nitrogen, that's right. It's nitrogen because there's a lot of nitrogen in the in the atmosphere in the air, right? And that's dissolving constantly into the, into the water. Okay, so fish use their gills, of course, 
to extract oxygen out of, out of the water. Okay? So that's how they breathe. Um, and, you know, fish, by the way, they do the same thing that you do. We breathe in the air, we extract the oxygen with our lungs, and then what do we breathe out? What gas do we emit out of the water? Carbon dioxide. So fish are doing the exact same thing. They're breathing in the oxygen, they're releasing CO2 back into the water, okay? So fish are going to increase the CO2 content. If you have a lot of fish life, it's gonna increase the CO2 in the, in the water, dissolved in the water, okay? So here are the most abundant uh, gases in the, uh, in the ocean water, right? So 48% of the dissolved gas in the ocean is nitrogen, okay? Which makes sense because nitrogen, you might remember, nitrogen is actually the most abundant gas in, in our air, right? In our atmospheric air. So it's also the most abundant gas dissolved in the ocean. So 48% yeah. so of it. Oxygen is about 36% of it. And then carbon dioxide is a whopping 15%. And that's huge because how much carbon dioxide is actually in the air? 0.04%. I know you probably think about CO2. I don't know, I, I would imagine if I, if I coming to this, earth science and oceanography the first, like right off the bat, I would have thought carbon dioxide was like a lot of the atmosphere, but it's not. It's a very, very small portion of it. It's only about 0.04%, okay? But it's way high in the ocean. You see, it's 15% in the ocean, okay? So that's a big difference. Um, this is the actual concentration, though, in the, in the ocean water in ppm. So nitrogen is only 10 to 18 ppm. Look at this, oxygen is only up to maybe maximum 13 ppm, parts per million. So that means if you have a million H2O molecules, you only have maybe 13 oxygen molecules mixed in with that. Isn't that crazy? Think about that, because the fish, they need that oxygen, right? So think of like, oxygen in the water is a big, big deal for marine life. There's not really very much of it, and a lot of marine life needs that oxygen, right? So it's, it's kind of crazy when you think about how little oxygen there actually is available in the water, and then how much you know, fish life there actually is in the water, right? So it's, I don't know, I find that kind of staggering, but Anyway, and there's a lot of, look at how much carbon dioxide is in the, you know, up to, up to 107 ppm there. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, those are the three most important gases. Now, here's something that's a little bit, gas is different than solids in the way they dissolve into the water. You all know, or I hope you all know, that hot water is better at dissolving solids, right? So hot, you know, that's why when you make tea, you make hot tea, the sugar dissolves in your hot tea a lot better than if you try to add sugar. You ever try to add sugar to like cold iced tea? You ever get like an unsweetened iced tea and then you drink it and you're like, I really want it to sweeten up. And you try to add sugar to it. It doesn't hardly work at all, right? You're trying to mix in the sugar, it never mixes in, so it's cold, right? So. That's actually the opposite of how gases behave. Gases dissolve better into cold liquids than they do into hot liquids, okay? So actually, um, you know how sometimes your CO, you know, your carbonated beverage will just like explode, right? It's much more likely to do that with a, on a hot day if the beverage is hot than if it's cold. So if you have like a hot, you have a, like a two liter bottle of soda that's been in your car in August, and you try to open it, it's much more likely to open. So, um, now where's all that oxygen come from in the ocean? Where do you think all the oxygen in the ocean comes from? Yeah, it's kind of up there. That's a hint. Yeah. <laughs> well, it actually comes from two places, right? There's, there's some from just the atmospheric oxygen, right, dissolving into at the surface. But there's also, remember, the phytoplankton. So just like trees release oxygen into our atmosphere, phytoplankton are like the trees of the ocean, okay? And they release a lot of oxygen into the ocean. And actually, these little guys, they're doing photosynthesis, right? Just like the trees. And 
they actually absorb something like 80% of the carbon dioxide that's taken up through, by the from the atmosphere. So 80% of the photosynthesis that's going on on Earth is happening through little marine photosynthetic organisms. Okay, so a lot of people, like when they're thinking about how do we remove carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, a lot of people have you know, been thinking about how they can increase phytoplankton. Some people have done discussion posts about it. Who did discussion? Somebody did the discussion posts about that. About iron. I keep asking. Maybe it was fluorescent. Maybe she's not here. But, um, anyway. So uh, if we go back to the lecture assignment. Coal, so number 16, three most important gases dissolved in the ocean are? Right, OK. And then cold water or warm water, which can hold more gas? Cold water. cold water, OK. Now, let's take a look at how these things, number 18 and number 19, we're going to look at how these things kind of change with depth, OK? So um, I want to show you a little something. This is the solubility of dissolved gas as a function of temperature. Now, I want to, I want to show you some kind of, so this is actually how much gas can dissolve into, into water. I want you to take a look at something. It's, it's pretty crazy. How much nitrogen can dissolve into, so this is the temperature, right? So let's take, let's take 20 degrees Celsius, okay? Because 20 degrees Celsius is kind of pretty close to room temperature. Okay, how much nitrogen can you dissolve into water at 20 degrees Celsius? 10 mill, milliliters per liter, okay? Milliliters per liter. So a milliliter per liter, that's, that's one in a thousand so per mil, okay? So 10. How much oxygen? You can get 15 milliliters of oxygen per liter, okay? Look how much carbon dioxide you can dissolve into that. Isn't that nuts? Carbon dioxide is very, very soluble in water. It's very, very soluble. So look at this. You can, you can, put, you can put a lot more CO2 in the water than you can put oxygen or nitrogen. Okay. The reason that CO2 just isn't like wacky, crazy high is because in the, in the oceans, it's because there's just not much CO2 in the atmosphere, right? It's only 0.04%, so it's very, relatively little amount. And notice how, again, like I said, the solubility of gases, it goes up with a decrease in temperature. So, if the, so the hot water can only hold that much CO2, cold water can hold that much CO2. Okay, so you see that, so there's a negative correlation. All right, so here's oxygen and CO2 as a function of depth in the ocean. Oxygen and CO2 as a function of depth in the ocean. So what do you see here looking at this graph? Yeah, and they almost kind of like mirror each other, right? They kind of, so does anybody have any ideas? So oxygen is very high near the surface and then it starts plummeting down. And then meanwhile, CO2 starts increasing as you go down. So any ideas why oxygen, let's just take oxygen. Why would oxygen be high near the surface, do you think? Right, so Eliana's saying there's a lot of phytoplankton, right? It's the photic zone. There's a lot of sunlight, there's a lot of photosynthesis. Also, you're near the, you're, you're mixing with the air and dissolving just from the atmosphere, okay? So that's, that's one reason O2 uh, starts off high, then it goes down. Why do you think it would, why do you think it would decrease? Right, so animal life, as, as you move away from the surface, where a lot of the, the photosynthesis is happening, the animal life is using up that oxygen. Right? Now, it actually marginally increases with depth, you'll notice. So it gets a little bit higher with depth, actually. <laughs> And the reason for that is um, there's not as much animal life at depth. There is animal life up to 25,000 feet deep, but there's not a lot, right? So, so um, there's not much animal life. And also, as pressure goes up, just like if you think about the high pressure, like your, your bubbly soda is under pressure, right? You can dissolve more gases under more pressure. So that's why as you go up in depth, you go up in pressure, you're also going up in oxygen levels, marginally speaking, okay? 
Now, the opposite thing happens to CO2. CO2 starts off small, but then it, it starts kicking up really fast, okay? And the reason for that has to be, you know, the water is getting colder and deeper and more pressure. So that's gonna make it, that's gonna make CO2 more soluble. But also, there's very little photosynthesis down here, right? Because there's no sunlight. There's very little photosynthesis, but there's a lot of marine life. There's a lot of fish and, right? things that are, that are emitting CO2 from their metabolic functions, using up oxygen, releasing CO2. Okay, there you go. Does that ever happen to you? So that's why Coke bottles explode when you release the pressures, because CO2 can dissolve with greater effect to, to high pressure. So we answer number um, okay. We answered number eighteen and nineteen, right? So everybody got that. And remember, it's not enough to just say whether it goes up or down. You have to say a little bit, like one sentence, about why it goes up and down. Okay, and a lot of that is due to you know balance between photosynthetic organisms and and uh, consumers, right? So, so things that are consuming the photosynthetic organisms, so like the fish and things like that, marine mammals. All right, so we explained all that, 18, 19. Now, think about, now take a look at this. Oh, whoops. That's, <laughs> she's actually putting Mentos in there, that's the problem. Have they ever, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so what's, just looking at this, how might you think do you think there might be a change in pH um, as you go to greater depth? Because what's happening with CO2 as you go to greater depth? It's increasing. Yeah, it's, so it's marginally increasing, right? So um, you might expect there to be some slight changes to CO2, or sorry, pH, right? Because remember, it creates more colorant acid. And um, however, remember, there's also this, this issue of buffering. Right, because remember the presence of calcite can buffer the pH and stop it from getting out of control. However, and again, this gets see how complicated this gets. Remember, this gets then into the CCD. Remember, because at a certain point, there's no more calcite, right? It starts dissolving away. Um, remember the CCD, right? That below the CCD, the calcite compensation depth, calcite starts dissolving away due to just a lot of CO2 and carbonic acid. So, um, so there you go, dissolved gases in the ocean. Near the surface, there's a lot of sunlight, drives photosynthesis, produces oxygen, absorbs CO2. At depth, there's no sunlight, no photosynthesis, hence little oxygen as marine animals respirate, so that's oxygen. This is called right here the oxygen minimum zone, right there. I don't think I have an actual question about that. Um, So this is actually the pH. This is the pH as a function of depth, okay? And you'll notice that actually it remains relatively, relatively well buffered, right? There's not huge swings in pH as a function of depth. Okay, really things are going kind of between maybe getting up to, what would you say, maybe 8.25 right here. Maybe that's like a maximum pH is right around here. And then there's maybe a minimum, probably the minimum is down here at, at depth, right? So you see that indeed, because more CO2 dissolves into the water at depth, there's a slight decrease. You can see a slight trend decreasing pH, okay, with depth. So that's from more CO2 dissolving. But, you know, I, I think actually one thing, just looking at this graph that you should kind of take away from it, is that actually, you know, pH is pretty well buffered in the ocean. There's not a tremendous swing. You're really going from like a minimum of like 7.75 to maybe a maximum of like 8.25. Okay, and maybe the average, what would you say the average pH is in the ocean, through the whole ocean? Yeah, around 8. 
So it's a little bit more basic than natural waters. And that's from the presence of carbonate, right? All the carbonate in there, carbonate shells and things like that. Okay, so pH is pretty buffered. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip over some of this stuff. But, uh, you know, CO2 has been slowly increasing in the atmosphere, right? That's been well measured over the years. Uh, starting in this 1960s, we've been really keeping very close track of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, right? And it's been marginally increasing from maybe what, maybe 320 in 1960, and now we're, we are at about 400 ppm now, okay? So the more CO2 you have in the atmosphere, that's going to affect oceans a little bit, right? So it's going to put more CO2 into the oceans. That's going to lower pH in some places. So this is actually a global map of pH change, the change in pH in different places around the world. So where do you see a relatively high level of pH change? So what's that? Near the poles? Is that what I heard? Or? Yeah, so maybe around here in the more polar waters, south pole, southern ocean and the Arctic, northern Arctic Ocean, so that you can see the greatest. But I want to I want to point out something. The pH change that you're seeing, it's pretty small, right? You're, I just want to point out that it's not tremendous. You know, we're not seeing like tremendous changes. It's this is 0 0.1. Okay, so it's not like things are plummeting, right? So they're relatively small changes. Why do we expect to see such small changes, it's because, remember, the ocean is very much pH buffered, okay? Just like, remember, I demonstrated that to you with the, with, I put the baking soda and, and the, remember, I had the pH meter and I added, I added some, some uh, CO2, carbonated water to it. We saw pH could change in a buffered system versus non-buffered. Maybe you weren't there. So maybe you were just looking. Like, you couldn't remember. Sorry. But, um, were you there? I can't remember. Yeah, okay. Maybe it was. But anyway, yeah, I did, I did do that um, to show you how, how buffering works. Okay. So we answered everything there, right? So we're all good on, on lecture assignment number 15, right? Yes? Okay. I didn't get number 21. Number 21. What two components keep pH buff? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I kind of talked about this um, before. Um, but remember when I did that whole demonstration about chemical buffering in the oceans? But basically what's keeping it buffered is carbonate on one side and carbonic acid on the other. So the carbonic acid is trying to pull the pH down. The, carbonic, uh, the carbonate, which are things like marine shells, right? I'll think of all the marine shells that consist of carbonate. They're the things that are kind of pulling the ocean pH up. Okay, so the more carbonic acid it is, it's like a balancing act. It will, it will decrease the amount of carbonate available in the oceans. The more carbonate there is, if the carbonate amount of carbonate would increase, it's going to draw out and balance, you know, balance out with the carbonic acid. It will pull carbonic acid out, and it'll have a, but it's not actually going to change the pH very much. There's kind of marginal effects on pH. Okay. So we're all all good for number lecture assignment number fifteen. Now we got to start number number sixteen here. And the kind of. So now uh, we're going to change gears and go to atmospheric circulation and uh, continue. On. we'll see how far we can get. Okay, so this is actually the material that comes after the midterm and uh, you know, all that we just did was just catching up, right? So uh, we're going to get into now um, circulation in the atmosphere.
So we're actually going to kind of take a break from looking at the ocean very much because we have to understand the atmosphere and what's happening in the atmosphere. So that later we can come back and understand then what's happening in circulation in the ocean. Because we're going to, next week we're going to get into all of how the ocean, you know, ocean currents and how the ocean circulates and all that stuff. So um, to understand that there's actually a lot of interchange between what goes on in the atmosphere above and in the ocean below. So there's a lot of like relationships that, that are going on. So you'll see all this stuff as we continue through. So just going to kind of spend the next two lectures giving you an introduction to how the atmosphere, what the atmosphere is and how it behaves and, and how it circulates and global circulation that happens. Okay? So um, all of our weather and our climate, you know, it happens in the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is just that gaseous shell that surrounds the Earth. Okay, it's just the gaseous shell that surrounds the Earth. And uh, what is that atmosphere made of? So this is number one, right? What's the atmosphere made of? It's made of these three, there's the three most important gases that make up the atmosphere, okay? Overwhelmingly, those are nitrogen and oxygen. You probably don't even think about nitrogen that much. Probably you think about oxygen once in a while. You know, you need oxygen, but you don't really need the nitrogen too much. But um, the nitrogen is actually the predominant part of the atmosphere, right? So it's 78% nitrogen. Oxygen is about 21%. And the other gas that's the third biggest component in there is something probably you'd never think of ever. Probably you're like, I didn't even know that was a thing. But, um, so what's the third biggest component in the atmosphere? Argon, right, so argon. It's a noble gas. Um, I guess it's kind of fun, because you can buy argon tanks um, from chemical suppliers and fill up balloons with argon, and then the balloons sink and fall on the bottom, because it's a heavy gas. And I don't know, I guess that's kind of fun, a sinking balloon, maybe it's not much fun. Um, so which is a very important gaseous component of the atmosphere though? So these are invariable components, okay? So they don't change. There are components of the atmosphere that do change. And it changes with the weather and it changes with time over time. So there's some kind of what we might call variable components of the atmosphere, okay? So these are the invariable components, the permanent components. There's also invariable, com sorry, variable components, things that change day to day. The most important variable component is water vapor. So which is the very important gaseous component of the atmosphere that's variable? Water vapor, okay? Water vapor creates a lot of the weather that we see, you know, day in and day out, week in and week out, right? So that's what makes it feel very humid some days, right? Especially in the summer, it's really humid. Yeah, that's coming our way. It's supposed to be 94 degrees today. Oh, yeah. oh, that's crazy. But then tomorrow it goes back down to night. I saw that. I was like, no, that's not fair. That's the, summer has to wait. It's only, it's only like the first week of spring. Yeah, 94 degrees. That has to wait. So, um, yeah, humidity, that's the constant. So that term humidity, you've probably heard that before. That literally what that is, is the concentration of water vapor in our atmosphere. Okay. So uh, the atmosphere, like I said, it's just that gaseous envelope that surrounds the Earth. That's what the atmosphere is. It's just the gases that surround the Earth. It's the part of the Earth that is a gas, right? Predominantly a gas. So the very basic level, we actually split up the atmosphere into different um, kind of different sec sectors. You don't really need to know this, uh, all the sectors for um, this class, but I do want you to know this bottommost one I asked about, which is called the troposphere. So the troposphere goes up to about, um, about 10 kilometers high, 20 kilometers, no that's 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers high, and it actually contains the vast majority of the atmosphere is actually contained within the troposphere, even though it's the bottom layer. It's actually pretty small. Because you can see the atmosphere actually goes up all the way to about 150 kilometers. 
right? There's still gases up there at 150 kilometers high. But the vast majority of those gases are under only 10 kilometers, which is in the troposphere, okay? So the troposphere has most of, contains most of the atmosphere, even though it's only 10 kilometers, about 10 kilometers in height, okay? So uh, the, what's the name of that base level of the atmosphere? It's the troposphere, it goes up about 10 kilometers. And that's where all of our weather is happening. Right? We don't really have weather up here in the stratosphere or the mesosphere and thermosphere, right? So all the weather and all the circulation patterns that I'm going to talk about, you know, in the subsequent lectures today and next time, it's all happening in the troposphere. Okay, so it's relatively low altitude things that, that are affecting us and affecting the oceans. Okay. Um, so another thing we, we have to talk about here, so the, so the troposphere goes up about 10 kilometers, and then how does the density of the atmosphere change with elevation, okay? So like I said, it's very, it's very unequally distributed, okay? The atmosphere is very concentrated. The atmosphere is very concentrated at a relatively low altitude, okay? So the vast majority of the air is actually pretty low, all right? So the density, the actual density of the atmosphere drastically decreases as you go up in altitude. So you can see, this kind of represent, all these little balls represent air molecules, right? So you can see that near the bottom, there's a lot of air molecules, right? But as you go up, it thins out right away. And actually, by the time you get up to even 5,000 feet, which is not very high, okay, it's, it's really drastically decreased. Once you get up to about 14,000 feet high, there's so little ox, there's so little air that usually you need to have some kind of source of oxygen um, in order to, to breathe for an extended period of time, you know. Has anyone ever been up that high, like on a hike, like really high up, high mountains, 14,000 feet or something? No. Has anyone ever been kind of in mountains maybe 5,000 feet or, yeah? yeah. Uh, so have any, were you ever, Francis, have you been, you were, uh, do you ever notice it's harder to breathe if you're, yeah. yeah. So if you ever did like a hike in there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And some people like, you know, some people actually like Olympia, uh, Olympians, right, they actually will train at high altitudes because um, they, they get acclimated to the low oxygen levels up there. So then when they come down to, come down to earth, then they got, you know, they got like super lungs, right? So, so anyway, but there's a lot more air. The air density is much greater down here near the bottom than it is as you go up. So uh, you can see this is showing air, uh, air pressure, okay? So air pressure drastically drops off, right? As you go from, from the bottom, the, you know, here on, on near the uh, surface, going up. So this is only 10 miles. You're 10 miles high, you're almost at nothing, right? Very little air pressure. So air pressure goes down, air density goes down, as you go up in altitude, and it like shoots down really drastically. Okay. Now, um, probably you all realize this. What happens to temperature as you go up, like into the mountains, or you go up? Your elevation changes. It gets colder, right? That's why the mountains, you know, usually it's colder than what you experience down here near sea level like we are at here in Corpus Christi. We're very, very close to sea level, right? So, uh, yeah, it gets colder. So, things generally speaking, in the, well, in the troposphere, things get colder as you go up in altitude, right? That rate of change is called the lapse rate. You hear me talking about the lapse rate this, the lapse rate that. I'm referring to the change in temperature with change in altitude. Okay. So we're just getting kind of all this basic vocabulary right now. Okay. Really, a lot of today's lecture is just kind of introducing a lot of things about the atmosphere. And then we're going to really talk about how the atmosphere circulates and global patterns. Now, one thing that's kind of crazy is that this is showing temperature as a function of elevation, okay? Temperature as a function of elevation. Right down here at the bottom, you can see this is the troposphere, okay, troposphere. 
and the temperature goes to the left, right, as you go up in the troposphere, that means it gets smaller. But notice what happens when you get into the stratosphere. It starts heating up again. So actually, it doesn't get colder forever. It actually will start heating up as you get into the stratosphere. And it'll actually get up to, oh, ooh, a comfortable negative 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that's actually, it's pretty cold. But, um, but it does heat up in the stratosphere. So it's kinda, that's kind of interesting. Um, and the reason that it's heating up in the stratosphere is because this is where the ozone layer is, and that ozone layer is absorbing all of that beautiful UV light, harm, I shouldn't say beautiful, it's the harmful UV radiation from the sun. The ozone layer is absorbing all of that. And that's, you know, you've heard people talk about the ozone layer before, right? Now, like there's holes in the ozone layer and it's a problem. People can get skin cancer because, you know, they're getting exposed to UV radiation because there's a hole in the ozone layer. So the, hose, the ozone layer actually protects us from harmful UV radiation from the sun. So um, that's why it actually heats up in the stratosphere. It's heating up because it's absorbing all that UV radiation. And that's just because that's where the ozone likes to hang out. All right, so um, why does it get colder as you go up in the troposphere? I still haven't explained that. So why? Does it get colder as you go up in the atmosphere? So you can see, have, have any of you ever seen this on mountains? There's like the snow line right there. Isn't that kind of cool? Like you notice like there's no, you know, there's a certain point, there's absolutely no snow below there, right? And it's because you're literally seeing the change in the temperature with the change in the altitude, right? So you're, as you go up, it gets cold enough, and then you start getting snow and more snow and more snow, right? Okay, so that's the snow line, right? Um, so why does that happen? Now, um, any ideas? It's kind of a weird, kind of a weird thing, actually. Uh, I hear people say, "Shouldn't it get?" A lot of people said, "Shouldn't it get hotter because you're getting closer to the sun, right?" And I guess you are getting a little bit closer to the sun, but it's only by a tiny amount. Because remember, the sun is 150 million kilometers away, so going up one kilometer doesn't really change things very much. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is. I'm going to show you. This is why. This is kind of a crazy thing. This is why it gets colder as you go up into the atmosphere. You ready? Hairspray. So um, has anyone ever gotten like an aerosol can like this of hairspray and you're spraying it and it gets cold? Have you had that yeah, before, right? Or, or you know what the worst thing is? Has anyone ever used one of those air dusters for computers? It gets really cold. I mean, it gets so cold it like starts making like you can like get frost on it. If you get so cold, if you use that for like more than a few seconds, it's like you can't even touch it. It's so cold, right? This is actually why it gets colder as you go up into the atmosphere. One of the funny things about air, one of the funny things about air is when it depressurizes and decompresses it gets colder, okay? And what happens to air pressure when you go up? It depressurizes, right? Pressure goes down. Well, as pressure goes down, the air depressurizes and it cools off. And that is called, de, that's called de, uh, adiabatic cooling. Adiabatic cooling, which is kind of a weird word. So uh, yeah, as you know, the, as you go up in elevation, the pressure goes down. And so as air rises, it decompresses and it cools, just like when you have that spray bottle of hairspray or, or whatever aerosol spray, you're spraying it and the can gets cold, it's depressurizing, it's releasing pressure, and it's gonna cool down. If you wanna know why that happens, it ha gets into thick thermodynamics that I could explain with great joy to you if you want to know, but I assume that nobody's ever taken me up on this offer. So. But yeah, it, it has to do with thermodynamics, so it's just, and it, it actually has to do with, um, with, it actually has to do with first law of thermodynamics and, and um, conservation of heat energy, conservation of energy. So I'll just keep it at that. But yeah, the, you should take it for a fact that any gas, when it decompresses, it's going to cool down. Okay. 
So as air rises into the atmosphere, it's always going to cool down, always. So air rises, it's going to cool down. Okay? So take a little parcel of air like this, okay? Pretend you're a little parcel of air, little balloon, and you're at 10 degrees Celsius, okay? And then you're going to start rising. And as you rise, you're going to expand. Why, are, why, does, he ex, why does the balloon expand? There's less pressure, right? So there's less pressure. And as he expands, he's also going to cool down. Because whenever you expand and you depressurize, you cool down, OK? And he's going to keep going. He's going to depressurize even more. He gets bigger. You're just gonna, the temperature is going to drop again. And then he's going to get bigger, and the temperature is going to drop. The, the lapse rate, what is the lapse rate again? Change in, change in temperature with the change in altitude. The lapse rate in the atmosphere, so that's the change in temperature due to decompression, is 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. So if you go up, uh, if you go up a thousand meters, that's quite a lot. Remember, that's three thousand feet. That's over three thousand feet. You expect the temperature to go down by about ten degrees Celsius, which is quite a bit. So ten degrees Celsius at a thousand meters, two thousand meters, you've gone down to zero degrees Celsius. You go up another thousand meters, you've gone down to negative ten degrees Celsius. Okay. So that's called the adiabatic lapse rate adiabatic lapse rate. So adiabatic lapse rate, the adiabatic lapse rate is the rate of cooling due to depressurization. So adiabatic lapse rate the rate of cooling due to depressurization. Okay, y'all got that? So adiabatic lapse rate is the rate of cooling due to that adiabatic decom that de decompression. By depressurization. And it is about nine, it's about 10 degrees Celsius per thousand meters. Now, lapse rates come in three flavors, okay? Three flavors of lapse rates. What's a lapse rate again? The change in temperature with the change in altitude. Okay, they come in three flavors. There's um, the first two flavors are called the Waller and the Dollar. The first two flavors are the Waller and the Dollar. Okay, uh, that's the W A L R Waller and the Dollar is D A L R. Okay, what that means is the wet adiabatic lapse rate and the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So the Waller and the Dollar. The dry adiabatic lapse rate is the cooling due to pressure change when the air is dry and it's not condensing. That lapse rate will change once you start condensing off water and condensation starts. So do you notice, so do you see the arrows here? It's showing the rate of cooling. As you move to the left, it's getting cooler. Okay, so we're gonna go up and we're gonna start cooling off, right? We're going up, we're cooling off, we're cooling off, we're cooling off, we're cooling off, and then all of a sudden, we get so cold that we start condensing, we reach the dew point, we start condensing water, okay? And when that water starts condensing, the lapse rate changes, and it becomes the wet adiabatic lapse rate. Do 
Do you see the, do you see the change in the rate of cooling here once condensation starts? Do you all see that? Yes, no, so, okay. So, there, so you see there's a change in the adiabatic lapse rate, right? You see how this is at a different angle than this one, different slope, okay? Why might the fact that the, why might the fact that there's condensation, why might that change the rate of cooling? Does anybody have any ideas about that? Why might the rate of cooling change You're on the right track. It says heat capacity, but um, it has to do with that latent heat. Does anybody remember back talking about latent heat? Does anybody remember what happens when water condenses or condensation? It releases heat. You all remember that? Water releases heat, right? It's when it condenses. So what happens is that the release, the release of latent heat here. starts right here, right? Because it starts condensing and making a cloud. That release of latent heat offsets the adiabatic cooling. You see that? So now the Waller, W-A-L-R, the, the wet adiabatic lapse rate, becomes less than the dollar. So instead of being 10 degrees per thousand meters, you go down to maybe like six, okay? Why? It's because the release of latent heat from condensation offsets adiabatic cooling. You want me to say that again? Yeah. The release of latent heat due to condensation offsets adiabatic cooling. So you end up having a smaller lapse rate. So the temperature does not change as quickly. So that's the conceptual difference, number 12. That's the difference between the Waller and the dollar. The Waller, you have condensation and the release of the latent heat due to condensation offsets the adiabatic cooling. That's the conceptual difference between the Waller and the dollar. Number 13 is really kind of like it's kind of a restating, but wh why, why is there a numerical difference? It's because of the, the difference between them, again, it's the condensation, the release of condensation, the release of latent heat. Okay. So the difference is the Waller is about six degrees per thousand meters cooling off, and the dollar is about 10 degrees per thousand meters. Okay. Okay, so as air cools, oh, and then I, there's one more kind too. There's one more kind, right? Now the, there's one more thing you'll notice on number, on number 11. There's another lapse rate. Remember I said there's three flavors of lapse rates? So we did the Waller and the Dollar, and there's also the ELR. The ELR is the environmental lapse rate, the environmental lapse rate. Now, what on earth is the environmental lapse rate? The environmental lapse rate is just um, how much the air happens to be cooling as a function of temperature on a particular day due to whatever, whatever, the, weather, whatever the weather is on that particular day. So the adiabatic lapse rates, those are, those are basically their thermodynamic constants. They never change. They're, they're always 10 degrees or around 6 degrees per thousand meters, okay? But the environmental lapse rate is how much the temperature actually drops as a function of, of elevation uh, just due to whatever the weather happens to be that day. Because you could imagine that the day by day changes in the weather, 
are going to change how much the temperature is actually changing, right? Because some days it's hotter here at the surface, and it's hotter up in the atmosphere. And it just depends kind of on the weather. So the ELR is sort of like the weather. It's how much the temperature actually does drop as a function as you go up in altitude, okay? And like I said, that depends day by day where you are, what the weather conditions are, where you, you know, just, it just changes, okay? So I'm sorry I'm inundating you with a lot of vocabulary, but you're gonna, you're gonna need all these things as we go forward. So just think of the ELR as like the weather, the daily weather. It's just how much the temperature has, the temperature profile as you go up through the, through, through the atmosphere on whatever day, okay? Okay, so I know that's like really thick, heavy stuff, but it's, it gets better. The waller and the dollar are some of like the hardest things to understand in the class. So it's, if you feel kind of confused, it's it's okay. So, um, but anyway, so uh, let's go on. So uh, as air cools and it rises, um, it's going to begin to condense and precipitate, right? So that's what creates. It's basically that's what that's what creates rainstorms and things like that. It's what creates the precipitation air rises, it starts to cool off, and when it cools off, it hits something called the dew point, and it's going to start condensing at the dew point, and then you're, and then it's, when that water condenses, it creates precipitation, right? Because condensation is going from water vapor, a gas, to liquid water. So this thing, we have this thing, like I said, um, the dew point. Have you have you all heard of the dew point before? You never heard of it? Never? Has anyone ever heard of the dew point? Somebody, a few people are saying yes, yeah. Okay, dew point, well, if you ever watch like the Weather Channel, I don't know if anybody ever, okay, maybe nobody's watched the Weather Channel. But uh, if you check the weather, sometimes they talk about the dew point. Okay, so the dew point is the temperature at which a parcel of air reaches saturation. So it starts to condense, okay? So if we were to start, like let's say we got on the thermostat over here and we started turning down the temperature, okay? And we turned it down to really, really low. Maybe we turned it down to 40 degrees or 30 degrees or something, okay? And it got really cold in here. Eventually, it's gonna get so cold in here it's, you're gonna to start to see like frost, you know, building up and dew building up on the surfaces here. You're gonna start seeing your breath, right? You, see, you, start, you know how it starts to, you're able to see your breath when it gets cold? That's because it's reached the dew point, okay? So when water, when water uh, vapor reaches the dew point, it's gonna condense, okay? So number 14, it says, when air reaches the dew point, it's saturated with water vapor and it begins to condense okay so that's what's going to happen that's what happens that's what creates rainstorms and, and thunderstorms and things like that all the weather that you experience right air rises and it cools as it rises and eventually it hits the dew point right there see how it reached the dew point and then it starts to condense and then it, and then it can, that's when you get precipitation and, and things like that, right? See, so that's when you get the rainstorms and all that, all that stuff, okay? Snowstorms or rainstorms or whatever. Okay, so um, this graph, what you're seeing right here, is the maximum amount of water vapor that you can get as a function of temperature, okay? So... Just like with the ocean, right, you know, you can only have a certain amount of gases dissolved in, you know, in the water, right? And the same thing with air. You can only have a certain amount of water vapor dissolved into the air. You can only have a certain amount dissolved in the air. And that certain amount depends upon the temperature, okay? So if you look at this graph, what you see on the x-axis is temperature, okay? What you see on the y-axis is humidity. It's the actual amount of water you can dissolve into the air, okay? So let me ask you all, what happens 
to what, how, does, how does it change with temperature? How does the maximum amount of humidity change as a function of temperature? Goes up, right? So you all see that? So that's the maximum amount that you can put in a parcel of air. It's the maximum amount of, of uh, humidity that you can put into a parcel of air of a given temperature. Does that make sense to everybody? I feel like I've lost some of it. You're like, okay. Well, so this is the maximum amount of humidity you can have for a parcel of air of a given temperature. Okay. So, um, you know, once you get to a certain level, once you get to a certain temperature. So let's say that you have 10 grams grams of water per kg of air. Okay. So let's say you're right here, okay? And your temperature is 40 degrees Celsius, which is a very hot day. As the temperature drops, you're gonna hit this line, right? And then when you hit that line, what is gonna happen? What's that? You hit the dew point. I mean, this is actually literally kind of giving you the dew point, right? You hit the dew point, what's gonna happen once you cross that line, you keep cooling off? You're gonna start, yeah, you're gonna start condensing, right? You're gonna start condensation. And you're not gonna be able to hold that amount of, that same amount of concentration of water in the, in the air anymore, okay? So, it's asking, number 15 is saying, uh, what is the dew point of air if it has 15 grams per kg of water vapor? So 15 grams, this is 10 grams, right? This is, 50, this is 20 grams, so 15, we're gonna be right around here, right? Okay, so what is the dew point of air if it has 15 grams per kg of water? So at what temperature? Yeah, so you can see at what temperature? So it's about right there, 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So that's the dew point. What you figured out with the graph right here is the dew point gives you the dew point as a function of temperature. What was the uh, third part, so 14? Oh, so, um, yeah, so when air reaches the dew point, it's saturated, and then uh, it begins to condense, and once those droplets get big enough and heavy enough, it, it, that's what actually, that's when precipitation starts. So whenever you see a cloud, here's a question for you. Is cloud liquid water, or is it gas water, or is it solid water? So what phase is a cloud in? When you look at a puffy cloud in the sky, what is it? It's, it's actually not. It's, it looks like a gas, right? It's puff, you know, it's sitting up there, in hell, but it's actually a liquid. It's actually a liquid, or it's, sometimes it's a solid. Cirrus clouds that are very high, right? Those are actually solid ice crystals, okay? So how can a liquid be, how can the liquid water be up there, right? Shouldn't it fall down? What's that? It doesn't necessarily have to reach a certain temperature, but the droplets have to actually get big enough. That's the problem. The droplets are so micro, you know, they're so small that they, they can't overcome uh, air resistance. They can't overcome air resistance and fall to the ground. So they're kind of trapped up there waiting to get big enough and heavy enough to fall. So that's why you can see a cloud, and the cloud is literally, it's water. It's liquid water up there. But it won't fall down until the droplets get big enough and heavy enough to fall. And then, and then you get precipitation, okay? All right, so what I want you to kind of realize after all this discussion is how do we make, how do we make weather? You know, how do we get like rainstorms and, and snowstorms and thunderstorms, like the, you know, the interesting weather? How do we get the interesting weather? How do we make clouds? Well, it's very simple. To make a cloud, you have to cool the air down to the dew point, right? How do we cool down the air? How are we going to cool it down? Yeah, bring it, bring it up, right? So the trick to making a cloud is make it go up. 
You've got to, somehow you've got to make the air go up. That's the trick. Okay. So here's a question for you. How do you make air go up? Because that's what we need, right? We need air to get up there. And then when it gets up there, it'll cool off, it'll hit the dew point, and then it'll precipitate and make snowstorms, and rainstorms, and thunderstorms, and tornadoes, and everything else. Okay. So what's that? Yeah, heating it up. Isn't that kind of weird? You have to kind of heat up, heat, heat it up to get it to go up so it can cool down. So, it, yeah, but that's how it all works. It's weird, but that's how it all works. So, uh, clouds are microscopic droplets of water that condense when humid air reaches the dew point. So, those beautiful clouds you've seen, it's actually liquid water, totally liquid water. Okay. Um, so, so here's the question: How do you get how do you get air to rise? So, somebody said, yeah, Amanda's saying heat it up, right? So, because, and you all know that hot air is less dense, and less dense stuff is going to rise, right? Just like we did here with our lovely halo cline, right? So over here, it looks so beautiful now. Anyway, but yeah, you know, the denser water sinks, the, you know, and same thing with air, the denser air sinks, the warmer, less dense air, less dense water rises, right? So, so how does density... It says, how does air density change with temperature? Well, when temperature goes up, density goes, you know, it goes down, right? So there's a negative correlation. So you can see here, here's density of the air as a function of temperature. When the density, when the temperature is cold, the density is high. And when the temperature goes up, the density goes low. Okay? So that's why we have hot air balloons, right? Hot air balloons, you heat up the air, it makes it rise. We don't have cold air balloons, because if we had cold air balloons, they would just sit there. Okay, they wouldn't go anywhere. So anyway, it's 1220, I noticed, so we better break off. I'm sorry I had to go so much lecturing today, but I'm trying to catch up. But anyway, um, we'll just keep playing catch up, and someday we'll catch up. Um, I'll see you on, have a good weekend, right? It's Wednesday, so have a good weekend, and I'll see you Monday. And oh, leave your lecture assignments up to, yeah, leave your lecture assignments up to number, what, what are we on, number 15, right? So leave your lecture assignments up to number, or do you need more time on 15? Do people need more time? Yes. Okay, that's fine. Just leave it up to number 14 then. Okay, if you, so if you, yeah, if you haven't turned in number 14 yet, turn 14. If you want to turn 15, that's fine. You need more time on 15, that's fine too. Okay, so have a good weekend. I'll see you next time. Can you come to number 16 again? Sure. Let me um, turn off this camera though first.